The Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort. Thought-provoking. Informative. Engaging. Are you ready to be inspired and equipped? And now, The Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort. Welcome to the Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort. Now listen, when we were in England and in Ireland, mm -hmm. someone actually asked me, why is it sometimes you come on laughing and smiling? It's because this guy does stuff to me just before we come on. And so that's what that's about. Welcome to the Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort. It's great to have you with us, friends. Have you joined us live? TCZLive.com, Monday through Friday, 11.30 a.m. Pacific. And Ray, honestly, <laughs> see, I'm sorry. No, again. I've got to say that. What stuff do I do? You so people won't you know. You do that. stuff. No, I just said today I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just innocent, meek, gentle stuff. Just before we went live, I see don't what I go through, like friends. You. So anyway, Ray, I was about to say that I am seriously uh, in shock almost that we have 105,000 subscribers on YouTube. I'm sure they are too. Yeah. <laughs> How did I do that? Beyond their control. So friends, subscribe to our YouTube page. When you subscribe, you get alerts whenever we release new videos. And uh, it's encouraging to see that that many people around the world are a part of it. And also join us on Facebook, Emil Wayne, Mark Spence. Ray Comfort, speaking of Mark Spence, how are you, Mark Spence? Ah, great. Had a great weekend. It is good to be here today. Ray, how was your weekend? Oh, phenomenal. Good. <laughs> so, friends, we're going to go on now. <laughs> we're not even going to get into that. We're going to jump right into the wonderful, well, the lovely blood program. <laughs> huh? I can't even talk straight. So, yeah, my weekend went. Just jet lag. <laughs> yeah, jet lag still. No. All right, here we go. This is from Kira. Oh, that's interesting. What do you say to people who ask you how you trust in a God of genocide? Now, this is really no light matter because a lot of people ask this question. And Ray, oftentimes that seems to be the go-to question for atheists. I think we need to go to Mark Spence because I've got this sort of laughter hitting me at the moment. Mark Spence, yeah, Mark what do you Spence. think of that? caught me smiling about something. <laughs> All right, let, let me break it down practically. I mean, there's answers to these questions. Good questions, hard-hitting questions. A lot of times when this question is asked, they believe there is no answer to this question. Most of the time when this question is raised, it's because they think you cannot answer the question. That's right. why it is thrown into your lap. It's usually thrown up. It's trying to get you out of the sphere of where they're at. They don't want you to answer the question, typically. Yeah. They don't want to hear what you have to say. So if I'm going to answer this question, it depends on the motive on which the person asking me the question possesses. Yeah. Since I don't know their motive, I'm going to simply ask them their motive. Why do you ask? Why do you bring that up as an objection? Is this a real issue for you? And I might just avoid it altogether, not because I don't have an answer, but because I'm convinced they don't want to have the answer. And because they don't want to have an answer, I know the time is short. I'm going to hone in on the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. And I'm going to make it personal. But if somebody comes up and they're, and they're probing me and they're trying to go down and say, you know, you can't trust a God. He commanded genocide in the Old Testament, the killing of innocent people. Begin to break it down. Is the killing of innocent people wrong? Yeah. Were those people innocent? How do you know? How do you know those people were innocent? Next, objectively speaking, is genocide wrong? What objective standard can you present to me right now to say that what God commanded in the Old Testament was wrong? And what happens is this person is now going to set themselves up as judge to judge the judge of the universe. Yeah. They don't, they're not comfortable with God being God, and they're more comfortable in themselves being God, to put God on the stand, on trial, to hold him accountable for what he's done. Now, here's the problem. God is the arbiter of the law. Mm -hmm. And because he is, he commits no wrong. All of his judgments are just and true. All of his promises are yes and amen. Everything God does is perfect. 
What do you have to say about that? So it's, it's a little bit more difficult here. I mean, I've got the answer, and the answer is really simple. Whatever God does is right. But here's the question for you. What is the objective standard by which you're judging God? You, you, you can't. Yeah. You don't have all the information. You simply don't have all the information as to what's going on. And I'll give you a quick example of that just to kind of bring it down. I know you guys have a lot to say about this. It's no, simply this. Is good, this. Mark. Keep going. All right. What would you think of a man that I told you he plunged a knife into the chest of a seven-year-old little girl while she slept? What would you think of that man? Is that man evil? Atrocious man, perhaps? Evil act he performed? Let me give you a little bit more information. That man who plunged that knife was a doctor, a world-renowned surgeon living in Germany, and at his own dime, he flew out to the States to perform a surgery that that little girl could not afford brought in his own team, brought in all the own equipment. He paid for it himself. And that world-renowned surgeon saved that little girl's life. Mm. Now what do you think of that man? Remember, 30 seconds ago, you said that he was an evil man, an atrocious man. He committed an evil act. But with more information, you're able to put the pieces of the puzzle together, and now you want to lift that man up on your shoulders. You want to sing his praises. He should be on the evening news. People should know about that man. His name should be on all of our lips. Why? Because he did something that nobody else dared to do. And he paid a price that nobody else was willing to pay. Listen, God is entirely other. The only box that God will fit in is that box that says other. Hmm. He's not held in constraints to time. He doesn't need us. He chooses to use us, but God in his infinite wisdom sees the big picture. He is omniscient. He knows all things. And because God knows all things, he knows what he's doing, and he doesn't need your counsel. And because he doesn't need your counsel, he's not asking for it. And when you put God on trial and you say what he does is wrong, what he did is wrong, you're saying you know more than God. Hmm. And that is a crazy place to be. Why does God command genocide, the killing? of innocent people, first of all, there's none innocent. There was only one that was supremely innocent in this world. And he volunteered to die a death he did not deserve to die. He paid a debt he did not owe because you and I owed a debt we can never pay. So the beauty of this whole thing is God is in control. And when you know God is in control, you can rest at that fact. There's no softer pillow than a clear conscience. And when you know that God is in control and he's leading and he's guiding me with his eye, I can just rest in that. I can, I can just rest in the fact that he is my rest. He's mm -hmm. my portion. So I think, and it Amen. depends on how they ask the question, how they come across, would yeah. depend on how I'm going to answer the question. But since God is the arbiter of the law, he's not held accountable. And he's not going to break his law, the moral code in which he has set up. He's not a murderer. He's not a murderer. Amen. Boy, how can we add to that? Um, those that usually answer, ask this question are really trying to paint God as evil. If they can paint the judge as being evil, then the judge cannot hold them as being morally accountable. Right. So that's what they're trying to do. And there's no greater delusion of grandeur than to think you're more moral and you can stand in judgment over Almighty God. Yeah. It's a crazy thought. But the thing that needs to happen is that this person needs to be put in their place not as a judge over the judge, but as a criminal, a devious criminal under the eyes of the perfect judge. And the way to do that is to bring the law to the conscience. Amen. The other thing too is that, so <clears throat> your God committed genocide. So just say to the person, did this happen? And they say, yeah. yes, it did. Right, right. <laughs> so it's in the Bible. Yes, it happened. He killed, blah, blah, blah. So now God exists and he did evil? No, he doesn't exist. So it didn't happen. And so you just tie them in knots, because if it didn't happen, then it's a fairy tale to them. What are they getting upset about? Right. So it's quite yeah. crazy. Well, the thing that amazes me often, too, is that the person who usually has this qualm is typically an atheist that has no absolute standard for what is evil. Right. So what, what, what's the big deal? Are you saying genocide is wrong? And Mark, one of the things I love is how you answer a question with a question. Yeah, Socratic method. Oh, yeah. it's amazing. And, and oftentimes it's bewildering because like you said, they come at it with the attitude of, I've got that I gotcha question, you know? And when they hear the, question, the Christian respond, having an answer, but even before that, to respond with a question, often they're paralyzed. They stand there like, uh, ooh, no one's ever asked me a question after I've asked them one. But friends, look, it, it's important again to recognize it. that's the bottom line. Why did God call for genocide, it's because he's God. And we know 
that he's not a whimsical, a capricious God, but he's a God who is just, he's a God who is good, he's a God who is loving, he's a God who is merciful. So anything that he does issues from that. He's also a God who has wrath and a God who exercises judgment. And I think it's important uh, for those of you who know that it's important to go to scripture on these things to know why God called for genocide in certain cases. Deuteronomy 9, 1 through 4. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and to go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities greater and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you. Do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, Because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. So, Ray, often people will have this picture that God is just saying, Oh, go destroy these people, these right. nice, innocent people. But in reality, God was using Israel at his discretion as his instrument of justice to exercise judgment on wicked nations. And those nations were wicked. And Genesis is, <clears throat> sorry, genocide is the, the, the uh, killing of uh, a whole nation, uh, according to the dictionary. Um, but God didn't stop there. He proclaimed the death sentence upon the whole of humanity. Right. So if an atheist wants to get really upset at God, go and visit a graveyard. I mean, everybody dies because God proclaimed the death sentence upon the guilty criminals that we are. The soul that sins it shall die, the wages of sin is death, and his judgments are righteous and true altogether. But the same judge who is holy and righteous is rich in mercy, and he provided a savior for those who want to live. Amen. And that's the message we preach, not one of con condemnation, but one of forgiveness and repentance and faith in Jesus to everlasting life. Amen. Yeah, and for those of you who are our atheist friends out there who are watching, please don't focus on that part that you see as the negative part that you can't figure out in your mind and that you think you're justified in questioning God on. Please recognize the good news like Ray just shared. God sent his son to come and die on a cross and rise again so that those who repent and place their faith in him can have everlasting life. And that is good news. All Excuse right. me. That is good news. <laughs> yeah, right. And that is good news. <laughs> that was stupid. That is amazing news. And uh, we have no words to describe how amazing Absolutely. it is. But we're going to move on to something else now in connection with what Ray mentioned. Ray, you mentioned the importance of using the Ten Commandments, using the law of God. Yeah. And friends, it's kind of weird when um, you produce something and you don't remember that you produced it. And that's what happened with this video. Watch it and we'll talk about it when we come back. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Look at the runner. He's coming in first. He's number one. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. That means God should be number one in your life. The second commandment is, you shall not make yourself any graven image. That is, don't bow down to anything but God. But look at that man. He's bowing down to an idol in the shape of a number two. The second commandment is, you shall not make yourself any graven image. Don't bow down to anything but God. The third commandment is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Don't use your lips to dishonor God. Look at those big red lips. They're dishonoring God, and they're in the shape of the number three. The third commandment is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The fourth commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Don't neglect the things of God. Look at that boy. He watches TV all the time and never gives special time to God. And he's inside the number four, reminding us that the fourth commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The fifth commandment is, honor your father and your mother. Look at mum and dad. Oh, they've shaped themselves into the number five, reminding us that the fifth commandment, number five, is honor your father and your mother. Uh-oh, look at that bomb. It could kill someone. And it's in the shape of the number six, reminding us the sixth commandment is, you shall not kill. The seventh commandment is, you shall not commit adultery. Adultery leaves a heart broken. Always be faithful to the one you marry. Look at that heart. 
Inside it is the number seven, and it's broken, reminding us that the seventh commandment is, you shall not commit adultery. The eighth commandment is, you shall not steal. Look at this burglar, this thief. He's trying to steal something. His mask is in the shape of a number eight, reminding us the eighth commandment is, you shall not steal. The ninth commandment is, you shall not lie. That means we should always speak the truth. Look at that nine. He's lying in bed. He's a lying nine, reminding us that the ninth commandment is, you shall not lie. The tenth commandment is, you shall not covet. We shouldn't want what others have. We shouldn't be greedy. Look at that greedy man looking through the doorway at the diamond ring. The doorway and the ring are in the shape of the number 10, reminding us that the tenth commandment is, you shall not covet. We just discovered that's Mark Spence's favorite video. How many times, Mark, did you say you watched that video? <laughs> I have never <laughs> seen that video in my life, oh, ever. Boy. We, that's in one of our videos, huh? Yeah, yes. in one of them. Uh, yeah, uh, we recorded it years ago. I, I love it. Yeah, and, and it really works. The dumber the illustration, the better, like the, <laughs> the lying nine. You never forget that. And I put this on my Facebook page, thanks to Alan, who encouraged us to do so. And people, the comments were saying, I learned the Ten Commandments in three minutes. This is just wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's also <clears> in our uh, Albert Brainstein track. Brainstein. Brain, Brainstein. <laughs> Brain, <laughs> Brainstein. <laughs> Brainstein track. And believe it or not, friends, honestly, when I'm sharing the gospel and I'm going through the commandments, or wherever I'm recalling the commandments, those images are exactly what I use. Oh, really? Oh, absolutely. It's quick. It just, yeah. You just see them in your head. You yeah, that's so, a, a wonderful yeah. principle. All right, friends, on to another question. This is from Stephen in Arizona. You always mention going out to witness in groups or pairs. Have you ever gone out solo, and would you recommend it to someone else? I understand the reasoning for going together, but I would like to hear your thoughts expressed in this area. So Mark Spence, what do you think about that? Often, uh, not just Living Waters, but other ministries encourage people to go out in pairs. Is this a biblical principle? Does it have to be done every time? What say you? Well, Jesus sent them out in pairs, in groups of two. Is he saying that you have to go out in groups of two? No, absolutely not. In fact, my preference is to go out by myself. I would rather go out by myself. Or the absolute ideal preference is to be teamed up with someone who can almost finish my sentences, knows where I'm heading, right. the direction that I'm taking. And when I'm talking, they're praying. And when they're talking, I'm praying. And it's a bit of a tag team that is going on. It's not always like that. You know, we will, a lot of times, we'll have somebody with us when we hit the streets. Tonight, we'll be going to um, so, someplace out to share the gospel. I remember, like, last Friday, we went to uh, the Orange Outlet, of the Blocks at Orange, and had a great time. Uh, Ray, yesterday, or Saturday, he went out to uh, the beach. Phenomenal time that he had. And go on and on about that. But, you know, here's the idea. The idea is, when possible, have somebody with you for so many different reasons, even accountability. That person attacked me. That person said this about me. I remember one time we were in the Third Street Promenade with uh, Ray, and this lady was saying uh, that Ray had touched her. Well, I had a video camera going the whole time on the situation. Ray's running away from this woman the whole time. And she goes and gets the police, and I showed the police the video camera that Ray did no such thing, and the police went their way. So when possible, yeah, have somebody with you. Ideal situation, for sure. Always practical, always able to do that? Nope. Does that mean we don't share the gospel? No, absolutely. We always share the gospel. We're ready in season, out of season. That's just the way it is. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, Cameron had women chase him. They chased me for a different, <laughs> a different reason. I love that one with that old lady chasing me around. She wasn't that old. Wow. 60, <laughs> 64. Stop it. All right. All right, friends. Yeah, you know, um, and, and that principle is in Luke 10, and also Mark touches on it. But yeah, uh, going at Jesus sending out his disciples before him uh, in twos, he sent out the 70. But remember, friends, you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ, so you're always on. Uh, whether you have someone with you or not, we're not always with another person, but you're an ambassador of Jesus, so share the gospel wherever you go. But yeah, if you can have someone with you. Uh, it's great. It is nice, right? When you have another person, they're able to jump in. You often do that to me when we're on a plane witness saying, Hey, Zay, you got something to say? Always oh, not. <laughs> you go to sleep and you leave me for two hours talking. <laughs> open air preaching, um, I like having other people with me, but I preached open air for years by myself. Yeah. In fact, sometimes I like open air preaching by myself, and there's a good reason for it. 
If you fluff it, your friends aren't watching. <laughs> oh, or thousands of people through yes. a live feed. Yeah, I didn't like. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like those live feeds. If you can't get a crowd, if I'm with Scotty and I can't get a crowd, it's embarrassing. I say, Scotty, let's go home. But if there's yeah. a thousand people watching, it's not much fun. Yeah, I hear you. So yeah, Paul in Athens uh, was by himself, preached the gospel to the Athenians, and. Uh, so yeah, so it's good to have someone with you, good to have a group with you, but often it's good to be by yourself. Yeah. All right, friends, it is that time again for the Comfort Zone Bible Trivia. Again, this is for those of you who watch us live Monday through Friday, 11.30 a.m. Pacific at tczlive.com. By the way, if you don't watch live, that's okay. We, we'd love you to. But at tczlive.com, you, you can watch our archived programs as well as on our YouTube channel. But through either one, uh, you could see those. All right, get your typing fingers ready. The first person to answer will win. And today, we're giving away the 19 Kids and Preaching DVD download. No, not DVD download. Download. Free download. Uh, this will be available for you uh, uh, today once you win. But it's also available for anyone who wants to purchase it. You can get it a month early before we release it on DVD. It's $9.99. And uh, when you purchase it, you help support the ministry so we can keep doing projects like this. So you get it a month early. And as a thank you, you'll get a springboard for Budding Preachers ebook and uh, how to bring your children to Christ download as well. By saying, <clears throat> get your typing fingers ready, you're going to date this program. Get your typing no fingers ready. No voice activated. The future. Oh, that's the, right. yeah, just get your voice ready. No, to you're activate. dating it now. It'll be brain activated. Yeah, mm, go like that yeah. and you get the answer. Oh, yeah, like <laughs> Is that how you're going to type? <laughs> that's what's going to happen in the future. I predict it. Oh, boy. Okay, friends, here we go. Get your typing fingers ready, your head bobbing ready. Who else, <laughs> other than the wise men, came to visit Jesus when he was a small child? All right, there sheep you have it. would be a clue for them. Are you getting the answer? No, I just said sheep. <laughs> All right, we'll be back after this, friends, with the answer. Think of a number between 18 and 20. You got it? 19. That's the amount of offspring that sprang off from one couple, Michelle and Jim Bob Duggar, who took seriously the command to be fruitful and multiply. You've no doubt seen them on TV, but we guarantee you've never seen them like this. Open air preaching in front of the White House and obeying the command to go into all the world and make disciples. Living Waters presents 19 Kids and Preaching. The Duggar family, like you've never seen them before. For more information, visit livingwaters.com. You're on, All man. right, so the winner <laughs> is going to be mentioned inside the chat room in just a minute. We're still looking for that winner. Now, we're going to announce it there. Only people that watch us live, once again, are able to win the prize. And the prize, in this case, is going to be the 19 Kids and Preaching uh, Download. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be good. We're still having some great stuff uh, from Josh coming in. Now, listen. Um, God bless you guys for continually trying to win these prizes. What do you have to do? You have to go and tune in to TCZ Live. You need to give us your answer. And as the winner, you're go we're, we'll announce it, like I said, inside the chat room here. But inside the, the body, you need to give us your address. Sometimes you forget to give us your address. We have no idea where to send it. And inside the subject heading, you need to say, I'm the winner. So as the winner, you need to tell us that you are the winner. Our email address is email at tczlive.com. Dot com. That is our email address. Email us, tell us that you won, and we'll send it off to you. All right, there you have it. Okay, on to another question. This is from Brian. Where are your favorite places to put gospel tracts when you're not handing them out to people? Oh boy, I know Spence is going to have some answers, but Ray, let's start with you. I just <clears throat> remember a story I've told before where a lady called the ministry years ago and says, Somebody put a religious pamphlet of yours in a six pack of beer. She says, I'm going to call the beer manufacturers and come. Am I saying beer okay? Uh, beer. Beer, beer, beer. Oh, boy. What, is it the animal inside beer. a six pack animal? Yeah, there were six of these great big animals, grizzly ones. Grizzly what? Yeah, beers. And what did they drink? <laughs> beer. <laughs> I love doing this. All right, go ahead. So she's saying, I'm going to call the beer company and complain. And I said, well, while you're there, could you t tell them about their poison they're giving to people that destroys people, and slaughters people on roads, wrecks families, destroys livers and kidneys and lungs? Um, people get upset about it. I think packs of beer are great. Pla packs of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> packs of alcohol drink would be a great place to put them. Um, you know what, Ray? I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but it just came to me now to give this to you as an idea. But, but what about tracks on escalators, like throwing them <laughs> <laughs> everywhere we go, friends? 
things slipping, and every time people, ah, sir, your money, ah, your money. <laughs> nah, and back. elevators a great place. Always yeah. put them in elevators. But elevators let you down. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mark, what about you? Great places to put your ex. I mean, the case of beer is an all-time favorite because it's just ironic. Somebody's getting a case of beer, they're out <laughs> to have some fun, and you, it's just a big wet blanket. But there's other places. There's lots of places. Get creative on how you share your faith. Mark, have you ever thrown out million dollar bills on freeways? I refuse to answer that question because I was young when it might or might not have happened. Right. And I think Incredible there might have been an accident. I'm just saying, when you have a... All right. So cases of beer, a great place. But also with your bills. You know, not everybody pays their bills yeah. online with bill pay. But if you're going to put in a check, you're going to send off the bill, well, put in a track. I mean, who's to say that somebody's not or they can't get saved from that? Uh, m maybe newspaper stands. You know, you put in a quarter, grab a hold of a gospel track, and put it inside of all the newspapers, and let's see what happens from there. You'll never find out. Maybe you won't even find out when you get to heaven. But you just trust God to do his job. Go to bookstores. Put them inside bookstores. There's this Mormon bookstore I like to attend. Uh, to go over and I look at the books. They don't even know that I am a Christian. They don't need to know that I'm a Christian. I just put books, uh, tracks inside the books there and I walk away. Hey, see ya, Jim. See ya. Sometimes I'll buy something. Sometimes I won't. But there's so many good creative places and times to be able to hand out tracks. I think if you have a track in your hand, put it anywhere and everywhere. Go for it. Yeah. One of the weirdest things that's ever happened to me is in Jerusalem, standing waiting to get some coffee or something and someone tried to put a tract in my pocket. <laughs> Oh, and I turned around and it was in the guy. And it's someone you knew. He knew who for I was. Like last 20, 30 years. Yeah, and he didn't know who I was when he was doing it. He was just trying to get in my pocket. It was just a weird, oh, boy. a weird, weird. You thing. know what would be cool too, if anyone has an idea of how this is possible. But Mark, you mentioned bill pay. I wonder if there's a, a way to to somehow tag a track, a, like a digital track, within that. I don't think so, but that would be nice. Sounds good. Anyway, friends, we're out of time. What a what a bummer. But hey. It's been great. Except the program goes to New Zealand. Oh, I know. I thought I knew you were going to say that. Stop it. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us, friends. And remember, as always, to connect with us on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and to like us on uh, YouTube. And remember to get out of your comfort zone and preach the gospel for the glory of God. I messed that up. Bye. <laughs> for questions about the comfort zone with Rick Comfort, or to submit questions for future shows, please email us at email at tczlive.com. That's email at tczlive.com. The Comfort Zone is an outreach of living waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, check out livingwaters.com or call toll-free 1-800-437-1893. Now go and preach the gospel.